You've likely heard the phrase, every man for himself. How about this one? Do what you got to do to get to the top. But God's definition of success comes another way, a surprisingly different way. Welcome to Through the Bible, and today we'll hear Dr. J. Vernon McGee's explanation of this great truth revealed as we study one of the most glorious passages about Jesus Christ found in Philippians 2. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you, as always, aboard the Bible bus for another great adventure in God's Word. And while you find your seat and open your Bibles, let's welcome Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, who's here to give us an update on our mission to take the whole Word to the whole world. So what good word do you have for us today, Greg? (laughs) Well, I think the good word is growth, Steve. The ministry globally just keeps growing. And we're not trying to make that happen. I mean, we're very excited about it, but we're not forcing it. You you know, you sit on the board. The board doesn't say to me, Greg, we must have more growth. It is happening organically. It's happening naturally. And some of these initiatives are, are really exciting. And, and you and I haven't had a chance even to talk about some of these things up to today. So I think you're going to be a little surprised yeah, by a few of them. Before we yeah. press record on yeah. this, you were kind of leaving me in the dark. I don't know what's going on. I wanted on you to have a, a real reaction. So the first thing I want to talk about is, is a new ministry that we've just approved in the Kazakh language. Yeah. And of course, that's for Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Very good. Yeah. You are just, your I'm global knowledge is growing by leaps and bounds. Yeah. You know, Kazakhstan is, is, I think, think the ninth largest landmass in the world. It is a huge country, hmm. um, but it only has a little under three million people. Okay. I'm going to tell you a story, and tell me if it sounds like another story that we've talked a lot about. In the late 80s, there were only 20 known oh, Christians in Kazakhstan. Yeah, wow. See, you're a quick, yeah, you're a quick yeah. study. Mongolia. Mongolia. And it's amazing, the parallels. In 1988, they only knew of about 20 Christians in this huge country with uh, about two and a half to three million people. Now, today, There has been a revival, and it Mm -hmm. happened when they translated simply the book of Luke into the Kazakh language. Wow. And there there was a tremendous response just to the book of Luke, and now today they're telling us there are something like 10,000 Christians. So it really does bear a lot of similarities to Mongolia, and we want to be there just like we have been there in Mongolia to help Mm -hmm. these new believers study the whole Bible. Now, another piece of really good news is that in 2010, the whole Bible was completed in Kazakh. So we now can actually teach people the Bible and they can read, read it, it. Yes, for themselves. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And obviously with only 10,000 people in the Kazakh language that are believers, that also means they don't have the infrastructure of seminaries oh. and mature believers yeah. there. So through the Bible plays such an important role, certainly in the in the process of salvation, but also in growing in the sanctification of these people as they mature in their understanding of God's word and they need somebody to teach them. Yes, and now here's where it gets a little different than Mongolia. There is much more persecution of Christians in Mm. Kazakhstan. Islam is growing uh, back in the uh, early 90s when the country opened up. There were only a few hundred mosques. Now there are a couple of thousand. So Islam is growing, and uh, along with that, the persecution of those who say they believe in Jesus is growing. And so we want to be there, again, to support this young church, but also to support a church that is being persecuted. And if you're already a part of our World Prayer Team, then you know what it is to get that email every Monday through Friday morning and be able to pray systematically around the world and we would love to have those of you who are listening to this broadcast and think yeah i gotta i gotta do that i gotta sign up and maybe you're driving well if you're using an iphone use a siri reminder and remind (laughs) yourself tomorrow afternoon or tonight whenever to sign up for the world prayer team i can guarantee that you will be blessed simply by reading that description of that particular part of the world that we're praying for and then to be able to spend 30 seconds praying for a part of the world. Yeah. It will invigorate your prayer life, and it will kickstart it if you don't have a consistent prayer life. Praying for other people, other than just using uh, your time with the Lord for your, your needs and wants physically. So we would yeah. encourage you and to And Steve, that. I would add that imagine the opportunity to pray for a ministry like our Kazakh ministry yeah. that is going to be uh, just so foundational to the future of the church in Kazakhstan. Yeah. Let's pray as we begin our study in Philippians. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to play an active part through prayer uh, for different parts of the world that you would continue through the power of the Holy Spirit to move in people's lives and cause them to trust Christ for their salvation. We pray specifically for the Kazakh people that you would bless them, that they would be receptive to your word, and that your Holy Spirit would move in those people's lives especially. We pray that you would bless our study as it goes out today. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. 
Now back we come today to Philippians, the second chapter. And we're putting in today at verse 5 again. That's where we left off. It says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, what kind of mind was that? Well, we are going to see now in the seven steps of his humiliation. And he came down and down and down to this earth all the way to where we are. And you and I today can't even conceive of what a big step it was from heaven's glory all the way down to this earth. Absolutely, it's beyond human comprehension to understand what our Lord really did for us. A friend of mine, we were standing the other day at the Polly, as you cross over from Honolulu proper to the windward side of the island, you go across what they call the Polly. Well, it is really pretty high cliffs. I don't know how high they are. Several hundred feet, just a sheer drop-off. A friend of mine was saying, because we were standing there looking, there was a golf club down below, and he said, my, I'd like to go down there and play golf. And another friend standing there, he said, you know, he said, it's not far down there from here, but that first step is a long one. Well, that first step would be a long one, several hundred feet down. And I don't think you'd be able to play much golf. But our Lord came out of heaven's glory all the way down, as we shall see in these seven steps downward. Now, in verse 6, it says, this is step number one, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, here was the thing that I attempted to just briefly go over last time, and I'd like to pick up right there, that what it really means here, that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, it wasn't something that he was hanging on to. There was no danger of him losing his place and position in the Godhead because of any lack on his part or the ability and ambition of a contender. He was God without any effort at all. And he didn't come down reluctantly like this. Oh, I, I hate to leave heaven. Oh, I don't want to go down on that trip. Oh, that's something I don't want to do. It's not something, see, he held on to. He came down joyfully. And there was no danger of him losing his position or him not being God. He didn't say, and I want to be very careful now, I'm not being irreverent when I say this. He didn't whisper into the ear of God the Father and say, Now look, will you be sure and keep my place here right by the side of you? And keep a sharp eye out for Gabriel. I think he's after my place. And while I'm gone for 33 years, he might be able to get my place. And therefore, I'm reluctant to go. My friend, he didn't come down like that. There was no danger of him losing anything. He joyfully, it was for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He came all the way down. And he wasn't holding on to it. It wasn't something forced upon him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And it was a gift. And a gift is not something that's forced. If it is, it's not a gift. And he came willingly. If he hadn't come willingly, it would not have been a sacrifice. You see it all. And therefore, he came joyfully to this earth. Now, he left the glory of heaven. And he came down to this earth. And it says here in verse 7, the second step, but made himself of no reputation. Now, if you'll notice here, a better translation of that, the word here, is, and this is where the kenosis theory comes from, is the word kenao, and it means he emptied himself. Now, there's always been a question, what did he empty? himself of. And there were those, some of the first heresies had to do that he emptied himself of his deity. That when he came down, the deity came on to him at his baptism and left him at the cross. Well, 
This makes it very clear here that he emptied himself of something, but he did not empty himself of his deity. He was 100% God when he was a little baby reclining in a helpless position on the bosom of Mary. He was then a little helpless baby. But at that moment, he could have spoken this universe out of existence. Why? Because he's God. And he was 100% God, not 99 and 44 one hundredths percent, but 100%. There never was a moment when he was not God, when he came down yonder to Bethlehem. Now, we are told here that he emptied himself. Now, what did he empty himself of? And I'm convinced he emptied himself of something. Well, I think he emptied himself of the prerogatives of deity. Now, when he came down to Bethlehem at Christmas time, we make a great deal of the fact that there were the shepherds and the wise men. Of course, they didn't get there a couple years later, but that doesn't seem to bother the Christmas pageants that we have. And there was the angel Gabriel, and there were the heavenly hosts. And my, we think that's just great. Well, friends, I must say, I disagree with that. He's God. Did you know that instead of a few angels, instead of a few shepherds being there, did you know the whole universe should have been there? Every created creature should have been there because they're going to all bow to him someday. They should have been there. Caesar should have been there. The whole Roman Empire should have been there. Religion should have been there. The temple in Jerusalem should have been empty that day, and they should have come down to Bethlehem because he was born there. But they didn't. And why didn't he force it? Well, he laid aside his prerogatives of deity. He didn't force anything. He was willing to go into that stable there. And we always make it in the Christmas pageants a pretty clean stable. Well, it wasn't. It was a dirty, filthy place. And somebody says, well, it was the same place that the people slept. Well, they were in the adjoining building, I'm sure. But the thing is, it was not very clean where all these animals were. And that's where he was born. And he went up there to Nazareth, a little old miserable town, and he was raised there, and he was a carpenter, unknown, unheard of. And yet, probably, more people have heard of him up to today than any other person except Abraham. He's been a world figure, and he was brought up in that little carpenter shop up there. And he laid aside his prerogatives of deity. He could have had the Shekinah glory with him all the time, but he didn't. They always paint him, you know, with a picture with a halo around his head. He didn't have a halo around his head. Judas, even the night he was arrested, had to come and kiss him so that the soldiers would know who he was. He didn't stand out like that from the others. My friend, this idea today that he went around with a halo and his head in the clouds and looking up all the time... It was a big mistake. He was a human being. He had taken upon himself that. For he was God manifest in the flesh. And he laid aside those prerogatives. Now, somebody says to me, can you be sure of that? I think I can. Now, when he had finished his ministry, and you remember he was gathered with his own that last night. And in that prayer, that last night, He prayed a very wonderful prayer. It is the Lord's Prayer. It's in John 17. Will you listen to him? One thing he said in that prayer was this. Verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee from before the world was. Now, notice that. He says, I want the glory that I had. I want that now restored to me. Apparently, he laid aside his prerogatives of deity, the glory light, and it broke out on several occasions, as you know, and certainly after his resurrection, it was there. But now, he says, as he's going to return to heaven, restore to me the glory that I had with thee. Obviously, he laid that aside, you see. 
So he didn't lay aside his deity. He's God of very God, and he's man of very man. The oldest creed of the church says that. And my friend, that's the way it's been down through the ages, and the thinking of men today can't change that one whit. Who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Now, the third step down. And he took upon him the form of a servant. Now, he came to this earth as a servant. He was a carpenter. I suppose that you lived in Nazareth in that day. You could have gone by and said to him, Jesus, I have some repair work to be done at my house. Doors coming off the hinges. I wonder if you'd come fix it. I think he would have said, I'll be right over. You see, he took upon himself the form of a servant. He could have been born in Caesar's palace. He was a king, but he never made that claim during those early years. He never made it till he rode into Jerusalem in the so-called triumphal entry. But up to that time, why, he took upon him the form of a servant. That's the way he came into this world. You talk about the working man today, the humble man, the little man. That's the way he came into this world. He came not only as a human being, but he came among the majority, where most of us are today, little people. And that's the way he came into this world. He took upon him the form of a servant. Now, notice the fourth step downward. He was made in the likeness of man. Now, friends, that for years, did not impress me at all. Because very candidly, I'm a man, and I like being a man. I think there's a dignity about being a human being that's quite wonderful, to be in the likeness of a man. And how can that be humbling? Well, it's very difficult for me today to make it clear to you that the one who's Lord of this universe and the creator of this universe and the one who created man... May I say to you, it was humbling for him to take upon himself the form of a man, to be made in the likeness of men. He was a man down here. He came down not only to redeem mankind, but to reveal God to mankind. How important that was. Because how do we know about God? We don't know a thing unless what he tells us. And... When he came down to this earth and became a man, we found out a whole lot about God. And the only way you can know God is through Jesus Christ, who is God. But he became a man, like the little girl. She went upstairs. Her mother told her to go upstairs and go to bed. And she went upstairs and went to bed and turned out the light. And she began to cry and whimper. And her mother said, what's the matter? She says, I want somebody to come up here and be with me. I don't want to be by myself. And the mother said, God's up there with you. And for a moment, it was quiet. And then she said, but mama, I want somebody with a face. Well, may I say to you, Jesus Christ is God with a face. And he said this concerning himself. He said, I am the water of life. I'm the bread of life. I know about bread and I know about water. And I know about him now. He says, I'm the door. (laughs) He not only fixed doors, he was the door. And I know about doors. I got doors in my house. You know about doors. He says, I'm the true vine. I know a whole lot about vines out here in California. And I know something else. He says, I am the life. And I'm the way. My, these words. They tell us a great deal about him and about who he is. He came to reveal God. But notice what it says here. He took upon himself the likeness of man. Now, I say it again. I like being a man. And I can't see that that's being humbling to become a man. It was for him to leave heaven's glory and become a man. Let me give you a very homely illustration that I trust might be helpful in understanding this. And it's a rather ridiculous one, too, but it'll illustrate what we're after. 
Here in California, the ants are not killed off during the winter time. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't get that cold. And they may not move about as they did before, but they're still with us. And I didn't know that when we first came to California. It was November. I thought we were through with ants. There wouldn't be any about. And I got up one morning, went into the kitchen. Well, they had opened up one of the first freeways in Southern California to the Sugar Bowl. They were coming down on one side and going back on the other. And I guess they would have taken off all of the sugar. We'd let them alone. But I got busy and got rid of those ants. And then I found out that they not only made that freeway to the sugar bowl, they made it to the sink because they like water to drink too. And my friend, I want to tell you, I had ant trouble, so I began to find out. Well, I'll tell you what we do. I have a very wonderful friend here in Southern California who's in the business killing bugs. He's a bug exterminator. And about once or twice a year, he comes to my place and he sprays all over the place. And I haven't seen an ant around my place in years. Now, I have a notion that down in the ant world that they've had several protest meetings about me. They say, that fellow lives up in that house. He just doesn't like us. And we don't like the way he does. He's infringing on our liberty. He's destroying us. And they may be marching up and down with a bunch of placards in front of my place right now. I don't know. I haven't noticed, but they may be. And I'm sure they don't have very much use for me because I've really killed them all. No question about that. Now, may I say to you, I really don't hate ants. That's not my hang-up. That's not my problem at all. I just soon let ants live. Now, if I had some way of communicating with those ants and would be able to say to them, Look, ants, you stay outside of the house. Just let the sugar bowl alone, stay away from the sink, and I'll put sugar outside for you and water outside. I'd go that far. I'd be willing to do that for them because I don't hate ants, really. But they don't know that. Now, suppose I could get the message to them. How would I do it? Well... Suppose that I could go down and become an ant, become one of them, and communicate to them in ant language and get the word through to them. Now, if I could, I want you to know this, I wouldn't. You know why? Because I know some folk today that if I became an ant, they'd step on me, and I'm not going to become an ant, not going to take that chance. But suppose I could go down there and become an ant and communicate. My friend, that to me would be humbling. May I say to you that for me to go down and become an ant is nothing compared to what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he left heaven's glory and came down to this earth and became a man. It was humbling for him to become a man. And he was made in the likeness of man. How tremendous that is. He became one of us. And it was humbling for him to do that. Now, there's another step here. And that is the fifth step. And it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Now, the fact of the matter is, he wasn't humbled by someone else. Now, many of us, I'm sure, have been humiliated by someone else saying or doing something. But he wasn't humbled like that. He humbled himself. That's the most difficult thing in the world to do. One of the finest things I ever heard about John Wesley was this. One time he was going to cross a stream, just a brook, and there was a narrow board across. And as he went over, he met a liberal preacher of that day, and there were in that day, of course. And this liberal preacher swelled up, and he says, I never give way to a fool. John Wesley looked at him for a moment and smiled and began to back off, and John Wesley said, I always do. (laughs) May I say to you, it's difficult to take that humble place, but that's always made me think a great deal of John Wesley. It's difficult to humble ourselves. Well, our Lord did that, and he became obedient unto death and the death of the cross. We'll see that next time. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. 
We're richly blessed to have Dr. McGee's teaching about how Jesus Christ humbled himself for our sakes so we could be saved. This is a message that we're praying is received by people all over the world on Through the Bible. So to be better informed on how to pray with us, you can join our world prayer team as we travel every day by prayer to a different pocket of the globe where people need Jesus. Signing up is super easy. Visit us online at ttb.org forward slash pray. Or to find out the many Bible study resources that we offer, you can go to ttb.org forward slash resources or just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Well, tomorrow, Dr. McGee's study teaches us more about our precious Lord Jesus in Philippians 2. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.